The Philosophical Investigations of Wittgenstein is a strange book, if it is a book at all. The text has no unifying thesis and no sustained argument. Wittgenstein opens arguments without yielding conclusions. He poses questions which he never answers. Though he constantly tells us of the importance of context, Wittgenstein never gives us a context. The text is like philosophy on Mars. Let me say this again. Wittgensteinian philosophy is like philosophy on Mars. Wittgenstein writes about context endlessly, yet never gives us a context for his reflections. Having said this, two obsessions, two preoccupations emerge within its pages. Number one, the philosophy of language. Number two, human psychology. Most philosophers, Wittgenstein suggests, are led astray by trying to explain a hidden reality. Instead of attempting to unearth a truth behind appearances, we should look at what is right in front of us. Instead of attempting to uncover the truth, we ought to describe what is open to view. Those who pretend that the truth is hidden are really interpolating a truth that does not exist into what is already manifest. They are like men and women imprisoned in a room with an unlocked door. It never dawns on them that to escape, all one must do is pull the door open. Wittgenstein begins his investigations by quoting St. Augustine. When he was a child, St. Augustine tells us he learned what words meant by observing the objects that his elders were pointing at as they uttered those words. But this is a naive way of thinking of the essence of language. According to St. Augustine's view, and according to the view of most people, the meaning of a word is the object which that word indicates. But again, this is naive. It presupposes that there is some kind of hidden agreement between words and things. That's naive. As Wittgenstein reminds us, there is none. There is no natural or perspicuous connection between language and the objects in the world. The Augustinian understanding of language is simplistic. It assumes that one word refers to one thing. So the word dog refers to a dog. The word frog refers to a frog. The word log refers to a log. The word bog refers to a bog. But this misinterpretation decontextualizes an individual word and ignores the immense web to which it belongs. Each word is a node in a web, and that web is unutterably intricate. Wittgenstein has a contrary approach. For Wittgenstein, meaning is predicated upon usage. Let me say that again. Meaning is predicated upon usage. What a word means is based upon how that word is used. I can invent a nonsense word such as where do you and it can still produce meaning. Everything depends on how that word is employed and deployed. Only after the word is enacted, only after, only after the word is activated, only after the word is actualized, is there an association between word and meaning. But the meaning does not lie behind or beneath words. No, meaning comes after the fact, after the word is practiced. Let us say that a cafe owner wants her barista to squeeze oranges and make some freshly squeezed orange juice. She invents the word queer to you, which means for her, make some orange juice. Now, if this word queer to you were part of a private language, an idiolect, it would signify nothing. No one would, under, no one would understand it. No one would understand what she meant. And no word, excuse me, and no work would be done. But if the cafe owner makes orange juice or imitates the action of making orange juice as a demonstration of the meaning of the word, the word is granted meaning by the performance of the activity of making orange juice. She gestures at the oranges in the kitchen while saying, queer to you. <laughs> she demonstrates the action of making orange juice while she is uttering the word queer to you. Okay, so by using the word in a specific context, the cafe owner suggests a meaning. She does the thing and she uses the word while doing so. By being used, the word evokes a meaning. 
by performing the action of making the orange juice, as she articulates the word, she gives the word a meaning. Now the word is no longer meaningless. Now it has a meaning and all meanings are generalities. But if the cafe owner did not use the word, the word would be mute, silent, meaningless, dead. The employee now understands what the word queer to you means whenever he or she hears the word. The meaning make orange juice is now associated with the word queer to you. Now in paragraph seven, Wittgenstein introduces the term language game. In German, das Sprachspiel, das Sprachspiel. I take this, I, by this, I take Wittgenstein to mean that language is not a network of signs freighted with some pre-given signifies. No, language is essentially an activity. Language is essentially an activity. In order for a word to mean anything at all, one language user must articulate a word and another language user must respond by acting that word out. So language is a game between at least two players. A corollary to this argument is that language is not a game that can be played alone. Language is only meaningful insofar as it is played. Language is only meaningful insofar as it is played between at least two interlocutors. The question is never, what does this word signify, but rather what usage shows what this word signifies. This is one of the reasons why we ought to be skeptical, if not outright cynical of dictionaries. Words are not dead things that are housed in dictionaries. We need to stop thinking about it like that. Dictionaries are collections of simplifications. It is very easy to say what a word means. It is much more difficult to show how a word is used. It is also much more productive to do so. So if you want to know what a word signifies, look at how a poet uses that word. Turn to sophisticated poetic users of language and imitate their usage. For language, as Wittgenstein tells us, is a form of life. That is Wittgenstein's phrasing. Language is a form of life. And like other forms of life, language grows. There are those who name the linguistic turn in philosophy, which was brought about by Wittgenstein. As a result of the fixation on language, philosophy is now folded in upon itself. Philosophy was now concerned with words rather than with the truth or with reality. Thus, Wittgenstein marks a shift away from a consideration of noesis, that means thought, right? And moves towards a consideration of phone and graphe between, now there's a consideration of speech and writing. Now let us imagine that the aforementioned cafe owner points at a clutch of lemons. No, I'm sorry, points at a clutch of oranges and says, orange juice, she means evidently, hey, make orange juice. However, she doesn't say make orange juice. Is the word, or words, I should say, orange juice a shortening of make orange juice? So is the phrase orange juice a shortening of make orange juice? Why is not make orange juice a lengthening of the command orange juice? Why? When the cafe owner utters the command, orange juice, does she think to herself beforehand, I want you to make orange juice or simply make orange juice? No, no, manifestly not. The point is that it is unnecessary to think an ostensible full sentence before one speaks or before one writes. Language has no interior structure. Language has no interior structure. Language is not rooted in some unspeakable interiority. Here we discover that Derrida is a plagiarist of Wittgenstein, whom the former passed over in silence. He did. The point is that language, the point is that the language user hasn't defined her, her words because she doesn't need to do so. Let me say that again. The point is that the language user has not defined her words 
because she doesn't need to do so. Language users, those who use language and those who are used by language, choose one locution as opposed to another. But who is one to say that one locution is a complete locution, whereas the other is incomplete? Who is to say? Why do we consider make orange juice to be a full imperative, a full command, whereas we regard orange juice to be an incomplete imperative, an incomplete command? Why? This example is my own. Wittgenstein's own example is the imperative slab, as opposed to bring me that slab. Why do we assume that bring me that slab is the complete command? And just saying slab is an incomplete version of that same command. Why? Doubtless because we have been trained, tamed, groomed, brainwashed to believe that bring me that slab is the model and slab is a derivation or an abbreviation or an aberration of that same model. So before we speak or write, there is no pre-linguistic thought or intention, which would then be translated into words. There is only language, and language is all englobing, and we are players within its arena. To quote the 1975 film Rollerball, no player is greater than the game itself. Neither are words labels or stickers affixed to pre-given objects. Words are forms of equipment to be used in a language game or to present a different metaphor. They are apparatuses, instruments, tools, utensils, and such tools only make sense within a particular setting, a specific circumstance, a specific occasion, a specific context. In order to validate Wittgenstein's arguments for yourselves, conduct the following experiment. Okay, do this, do this experiment. Before you speak, do you think a complete sentence or a paragraph and then vocalize those precise words? Do you? Do you think and then speak? Do you? Do you, Before you write, do you think what you want to write and then repeat those words in writing in a graphic scriptorial form? Do you? Or do you perform speech? Do you perform writing? Now, if you do the former, then St. Augustine, St. Augustine, I should say, is correct. If you do the latter, then Wittgenstein is correct. Let me make this clear. Wittgenstein is suggesting that we don't think and then speak or write. No, we speak or write and then we think. Language does not reflect mental states or what philosophers call noetic states. That's a phenomenological term. I can't get into that here. If a student says to his or her teacher, I understand. Does this mean that he or she actually understands? So if a student says, I understand, does that mean that the student understands? No, no, not necessarily. And no teacher should ever think that a student who says, I understand, understands anything. I understand is merely a cultural convention. If you'd like a literary example of this, read the novel, being There by Jerzy Kaczynski, if he is the one who actually wrote the book, or see the excellent cinematic interpretation thereof. I think the film came out in 1981. Someone who says, I am alone, is not alone. Let me say that again. Someone who says, I am alone, is not alone. Why? Because the words, I am alone, open up the possibility of communication with someone who would be listening. Someone who says, I am in pain, I am in pain, is not in so much pain that he or she cannot announce the words, I am in pain. If someone says, I am in pain, the words that are uttered do not issue from the space of an inner experience. If I say, I am in pain, I don't say these words after I've turned inward and experience the sensation of pain. Think about it. 
if I say I am in pain, I don't say these words after I have turned inward and experienced the sensation of pain. That doesn't happen. I say I am in pain because I am in a hospital and I want the nurse to bring me morphine. We do not speak or write after thinking or feeling something. That doesn't happen. We perform our thoughts and feelings and language as we are speaking, as we are writing. If I say I am in pain, I am not in pain. If I say I am, if I say I am in pain, I am not in pain. If I say I am in pain, I want something from someone. It could be the nurse. It could be the doctor. The language in which I am participating is a form of behavior, a form of living practiced by someone who is living in the world. The expression, I am in pain, replaces the experience of pain. One's inner experience of pain is incommunicable. It can't be communicated. You can never communicate to anyone in a perspicuous manner your singular sensation of pain. It would be idle to attempt to do so. As soon as you articulate the words, I am in pain, you are participating in a language game and language is always social. It, it is compact of generalities. There is no such thing as a private language, an idiolect. The concept of a private language is not just an oxymoron, it's worse than that. It's an instance of antiphrasis. In other words, these are two concepts that just don't coalesce, they don't concress. In other words, there is no such thing as a private language. Language generalizes, language generalizes. We should have nothing to do with those who think that all generalization is bad. They do not understand that the statement all generalization is bad is itself a generalization. Now, let me pause for a moment. You know, it would be impossible for me to compass all of the nodes of this extraordinarily complex text. The text is not compassable in a brief duration. However, I would be an irresponsible summarist if I did not at least touch upon Wittgenstein's distinction between seeing and seeing as. Okay, so let's talk about the differences between seeing something and seeing something as something else. What is the difference? Or what are the differences? Seeing is, to quote Wittgenstein directly, I see this. Okay, I see a thing, and that's it. Seeing as means perceiving a likeness between two things. Seeing as means perceiving one thing as something else. Now, there is another term for seeing as, which Wittgenstein does not use. It's called pareidolia, pareidolia, right? P-A-R-E-I-D-O-L-I-A. -E pareidolia is the phenomenon of perceiving a coherent pattern in an assemblage of things that are randomly arranged. You, you might, for example, see a human face in an avocado or a cantaloupe or a kiwi. You might perceive a human face in the trunk of a tree or on a stone or on a mountain. You might perceive a cloud as if it were a giant, a nebulous goliath, right? A similar concept, which I'm really not going to get into here, is apophenia. A P O P H E N I A. Apophenia is the tendency to perceive connections between things where there are no connections. However, I won't discuss that concept here. And now we must discuss the famous duck rabbit, right? The duck rabbit is a drawing which appeared in an 1892 German Fuerton, a comical magazine called Die Fliegende Blätter. Die Fliegende Blätter. If you look at the drawing in one way, it looks like a duck, right? If you look at the drawing in another way, it looks like a rabbit. It is an optical illusion. Now I can say, oh, that looks like a duck to me. Yeah, sure. 
but then I am missing or ignoring the ambivalence of the image, right? Because again, this picture, which you should definitely look up online, this picture could either be interpreted as a duck or as a rabbit. Get it? Get it? You're seeing the duck rabbit composite as a duck or as a rabbit. I am not seeing it as a duck that could be seen as a rabbit. No, I'm just seeing it as a duck. I'm seeing a duck. I'm not seeing as. Get it? Okay. The same is the case if I give this account. I see a rabbit. Okay, well then I am again merely giving you an account of my perception. I am seeing, but I am not seeing as. Okay, I am telling you what I perceive, right? But I am not telling you that I can perceive the image as a rabbit or as a duck. Get it? Okay, but what if I say, oh, that looks like an optical illusion, this duck-rabbit composite that we're talking about here. That looks like an optical illusion to me. What if I say, oh, that looks like a picture duck-rabbit, or that looks like a picture of a duck and a rabbit uh, interfused, intermeshed, intermingled, right? Hybridized. It looks like a, it looks like a duck-rabbit hybrid, right? What if I say that looks like a picture rabbit-duck, okay? a pictorial rabbit duck. Uh, what am I doing then? I'll wait. Well, then I am doing something that, that I'm doing something other than giving you an account of my perception. I'm doing something more than just seeing, right? If I see the image as an image, I am no longer perceiving at all. This is the main point. I am talking or I am writing, get it? You see how this connects to language? I am not perceiving, I am expressing. I am using language now, get it? Okay, to quote the text directly, this is a quote. Seeing as is not a part of perception. Now Wittgenstein does not say this explicitly, but I can tell you as a corollary to this argument, seeing as is a part not of perception, but of language. There you have it. And if the duck rabbit is surrounded by a leash of rabbit, that means a group of rabbit, right? In one image, and it's surrounded by a waddling of duck, that means a group of duck in another. Do we perceive the same duck rabbit in both images? Let me, let me adumbrate this again. So there's the duck rabbit surrounded by a leash of rabbit, right? in one image, and then in a, section, in a second picture, you see the same duck rabbit, but now it's surrounded by a waddling of duck. Are you seeing the same duck rabbit in both pictures? In both images, does the same duck rabbit appear? Not if I comment upon the similarities and the differences between those two pictures. I'm saying, oh, look, this picture is like this as opposed to this picture. I'm comparing the two pictures. Then I am not seeing, I am seeing as. Okay, now what is the point of all of this? I'm sure some of you are wondering. The point I think is that perception and expression are not the same. Language is a different mode of living than perception is. Language is a different mode of living than perception is. The more we attempt to explain what something is, the less we understand what it is. Get it? You see how the book moves full circle? Now, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A.